Hey everybody and welcome to the One Wildlife Podcast with me, Abby Barnes. This is simply a show about life and as such there are no boundaries to where our conversations can take us. Along the way we simply aim to inspire, empower, educate and uplift, exploring how we can all live our best lives every single day. Before we get started, I want to mention that this podcast is hosted by Spend More Time in the Wild, which I founded in 2016 to help individuals get outside for the benefit of mental and physical health. Over the last few years, the project has grown into a worldwide community of passionate and courageous individuals working together to enjoy the beauty of our wild spaces and protect them for generations to come. You can find out more about both the podcast and wild by visiting www.spendmoretimeinthewild.co.uk. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening or head on to YouTube to watch the full episode. Sarah Williams started her career in banking, but in 2013, after eight years of office work, she packed her bags and started traveling around the world. It was while she was traveling and questioning her next step that she realized her love of three things, challenges, travel, and adventure. And so she took these passions and used them to found Tough Girl Challenges in 2014. Her aim, to motivate and inspire women and girls to get fit and active, to travel and explore, and to have big dreams and step outside of their comfort zones. Along the way, Sarah herself has lived up to the project's vision, having run the Marathon de Saabs, which is six marathons in six days across the Sahara Desert, through hiked the entire Appalachian Trail of 2,190 miles, cycled the 4,000 kilometer Pacific Coast Highway, run the London Marathon five times, climbed Kilimanjaro, the highest freestanding mountain in the world, and so much more. Sarah is the author of five books and the host of the two times award-winning Tough Girl podcast, which is listened to in over 174 countries and has had over 1 million downloads. It's impressive stuff, and I can't wait to dive into all of this with you today. So, Sarah, welcome to the One Wildlife Podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. What an introduction. I'm just That's embarrassed. It. <laughs> <laughs> it does cause a bit of blushing for some people. <laughs> oh, man. How are you doing today? No, I'm fabulous. I started my day off with some yin yoga, so I'm very mm. zen, very in the zone, feeling That's very... It relaxed and chilled yeah very happy got grounded i like that well listen i want to dive right in today i have so many questions i'm bursting to get to know you a little bit more as i'm sure the listeners are too today um i would really like to first of all start with your love of the outdoors now as i mentioned in the introduction you you started your professional career i believe in banking so did you have you always had a love of the outdoors and if so how did you sort of end up in banking which is obviously not the most outdoorsy profession yeah. how did how did all of this happen how did it all happen i did i have a love of the outdoors i think i loved being outside i loved being sporty so i was always involved in the sports teams at school so i was playing hockey rounders netball playing lacrosse um, you know, I was very lucky. So in the UK, we have something called the Duke of Edinburgh Award. So mm. I did my bronze, silver and gold. And that involves, you know, camping, hiking, map reading, learning all of these incredible skills. But I think part of me always thought that there was a path that I would just automatically follow. Like I didn't really think about it. It was just you do your GCSEs, you do your mm. A-levels, you take a gap year, you go into university, you get a graduate job. That's the sort of the, the career path. And I think especially when I was younger, I was definitely more uh, money motivated and status orientated. And I think when you come from, you know, my, my dad's an accountant, um, that sort of professional background, you almost think that that's what you need to go into. Yeah. And at my university, there's some ridiculous statistics. So I went, I went to Durham University, which is, a, which is a pretty good university. And there's something like 60% of Durham graduates go on to become you know, accountants and oh, wow. move, down to, move on down <laughs> to the city. So that's actually what I started doing initially was accountancy, but that only lasted for about a year because I'm not really an accountant person. And then I just sort of stumbled into, into banking, into relationship management, because I was living with, um, with five guys from, from university and one of them worked um, for a bank. They had an opening, an opportunity, 
looked pretty good. It was working in wealth management with high net worth individuals. Um, and I was like, yeah, I'm sociable. I'm talkative. I've got the, you know, the academic credentials to, to qualify for the role and position. Mm. And, and that's what happened. I sort of stumbled into it. And then, you know, you, you start working, you start getting your, your qualifications, you start progressing, you start gaining that experience and knowledge. And I think you don't necessarily realize what it is you're what it is you're doing I suppose I'd never really thought deeply about what it is that I wanted to do and at mm. the end of the day I was in my early 20s I'm living in London you know I'm, I've got a great lifestyle I do have a stressful job but at that time all of my friends had stressful jobs they were doing either you know accountancy law banking you know that sort of high pressured environment where you burn the candle at both ends mm. and I just don't think I really thought about it in that much in that much detail and, and that's how I ended up doing what I was doing until I was 32 years old yeah well it's, it's really interesting to hear that you know and I I wonder how many people just live their life steered by this is what you're meant to do you know I think it's such a common wheel that we can very easily get stuck in as you say it's like you do school then university then you get a job then you get a house then you have a family and it's rolling on and before you know it it's like oh I'm retiring now and <laughs> the questioning is not necessarily something that's nurtured. I think it's, you know, we, we get that from external influences, sometimes even a movie, you know, that makes us question, what are we doing with our lives? So I remember reading an article um, where you were saying, you know, one day you got up for work and you looked outside and it was a gray day and you realized you felt gray inside too. So can you walk us through that, that moment where you started to realize that something was amiss in your life? Yeah. Do you know, I, re I really remember this because, um, so I was living in Fulham, Parsons Green, and I was commuting over to Canary Wharf. Mm. So, you know, four, four minute walk to the tube station, hop on the tube, head over to Canary Wharf. And for those who don't know um, Canary Wharf, you come out sort of, uh, the tube drops you off in these like underground massive shopping malls, and you can get the escalators up to your building. It's got all of the, all of the facilities that you, that you need. And so realistically, you don't actually need to go outside at all and I'd worked out but after doing my four minute walk to the station and then you know getting into my building you know going in grabbing my breakfast um, heading up to my desk getting lunch there getting my evening meal there going to the gym there getting my hair done there you know, get doing my dry clean you know everything was in the building and then you know you left at night the same way back you walk past the the waitrose buy you know something to eat on the way home get on the tube come out four minute walk back home and I was like I'm spending eight minutes a day outside and that's wow. just insane. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know if people remember, I used to have like the Sunday night blues, um, you know, where you start already thinking about the, the week ahead and you know, what you've got on, what have, what have you got to achieve? What have you got to do? What's on the to-do list? But I'm a very positive, let's look on the bright side, positive, outgoing person, you know, I can handle this. And I don't think I necessarily realized like how, uh, how unhappy it was making me. Mm. And I think it just got to that point where, you know, you're con this is when Blackberries were around, you know, you're addicted to your Blackberry. <laughs> you weren't on your Blackberry. You were staring at computer screens or you were looking out of the, you know, the, these tall buildings. And I just remember this, the sky being gray and overcast. And that is literally just how I felt. Like I felt gray, like my, I was just like gray and washed out and just to be honest, burnt out, exhausted, and also, you know, not very happy. But I think the challenge with that is when people around you don't necessarily understand why you're not happy, but you have this great job, you, you know, you've got this great life, you're, you know, you're living, you know, in air quotes, the dream. And that was, that was very frustrating because I thought there's something wrong with me. Like, well, mm. why, why I, why I, you know, I'm so lucky, I'm so privileged, but I'm just not not happy um and it's a it's a really difficult situation to be in. I still I do not I still remember that day just feeling gray and looking out and just feeling like oh something has got to change in my life because I can't continue to live like this yeah but you know what's cool about that is you, you literally just hit the nail on the head you said something has got to change and I think or I, I don't necessarily know if that's that's something that everybody would think I think, you know, some people can recognize they feel a little bit rubbish, they're struggling a bit, but 
again, if we can't come back to that wheel, which a lot of people are getting caught up in, it can almost seem like, you know, oh, I'm feeling rubbish. I'm going to go buy something. or I'm going to go out for a nice meal. But you said something has to change. And this is what I love about your story is you, you are owning your life because your next step then, and I'd like us to, to talk through this a little, in a little bit more detail, is you go traveling. So do you leave your job properly to go traveling or do you just say, listen, I need some time out? What does that look like? That was leaving the job properly. Yeah, see, that's it intense. Was, it is intense. But I think, you know, to explain that, you know, the situation in more, in, in more um, you know, some things to bear in mind. Mm. At that point, I didn't have any dependents. I didn't have any children. I wasn't in a relationship. I didn't yeah. have any debt. I also, you know, I was very fortunate. I did have saving. And I also had, you know, a family as a safety net because, you know, my sister lived in London. She had a spare room. I could always move in with her. Mm. You know, I, I knew I could always move back to my parents. You know, I had these options available to me. So I was already in a very, very fortunate position in order to be able to make this decision. So although it was a big decision to make, there was backup plans and redundancies um, about it. Um, to, to be honest, like I didn't, uh, I knew I needed to do to do something and I just don't think I'd necessarily realize I think I realized basically that the job you know the job wasn't going to change the, mm -hmm. the work that aspect of it you know no matter what I did or how much I changed it was always still going to be the same and so actually the thing that had to change was actually me so I was in that fortunate position um I, I had a brother over he lived over in Australia so you know automatically right let's go spend a couple of weeks over in Australia my sister wanted to go climb Kilimanjaro. Right, let's go climb Kilimanjaro. My friend, I mean, and this honestly, this does sound like the life of Riley. So it's not me complaining. You know, I had um, you know, a friend who's like, oh, let's go to Florida and, you know, hire a Mustang and drive down to the Florida Keys. I was like, done. Um, another friend, you, you know, who invited me skiing. And I was like, yeah, you know, why not? So suddenly all these things sort of started to slot together. Yeah. And obviously that's great initially. But then you've also got suddenly this, this amount of free time. But then that big question, what am I going to do now? Mm. And I'd say for the first couple of months, it's, it's wonderful and it's amazing and it's stress-free and it's such a relief. But then it's also, what's my purpose? What am I doing? You become, I, or I certainly became very, very lost in like, mm. you know, not, not knowing. And also just feeling, to be honest, like a massive failure. Like you, I looked around at me and it's like, everybody else is you know on that trajectory they're progressing in their careers they're you know getting engaged they're buying the house and it's like and I'm just like bumming around like living this life of Riley but not really knowing what it is that I wanted to do and so I think that was a real challenge as well like trying to figure out my purpose what do I want to do next do I want to get you know another job in a in a, in a different bank doing something different do I want to move to a different country do I want to work for you know, for a charity what are my options and suddenly when you've got a whole host of options it becomes really difficult to actually make a step or to know if you're making the right step forward especially mm -hmm. when it's your your life god this sounds like a proper midlife crisis <laughs> Well, in some ways, it's a massive deal. You know, you've just left your job, you're traveling. And I think, you know, you could keep that going if you wanted to. I mean, you can, you can work away or, you know, get a job in some, on some Australian ranch or do whatever it is, you know, you can sustain that to a degree. But it seems like you're driven by something bigger. And you're very intuitive. Um, you know, you're picking up a feeling that, okay, this is fun, this is good, but you've just mentioned what's the purpose and what's that bigger picture. And I think that's really cool. I'm interested, Sarah, how do you process those thoughts? Do you journal? Do you talk to people? Do you keep voice notes? Like what works for you? How did you unpick this empty time in order to find your next step? Yeah, for me, journaling has been very powerful. Now, I'd love to say it's something that I do all the time and do consistently, but I did basically end up going to journaling when I'm struggling like mm. mentally to figure out my thoughts. Um, I just find there's something very powerful and especially with like a pen and paper, writing stuff down and sometimes when I journal it doesn't even make sense it's just more me just throwing my thought out onto the page or writing pros and cons and lists and and almost having sometimes these like fantasies and ideas of what the future could be and and to be honest it was when I was over in over in South America I was uh, you know I was spending about four, four months over there so I'd flown into Peru and I had a ticket out of Rio and that sort of time in between. So I was traveling around this massive, incredible continent, but via buses. And mm -hmm. so you're sitting on these buses for 18, 19 hours at a time. 
And for me, that's when I would just sit and write in these notepads and literally ask myself these questions. What do I enjoy? What yeah. do I dislike? What are my passions? What are my interests? You know, what could my life look like? You know, sometimes really big picture thinking and, you know, really like just not, you know, not putting any constraints on that. Because most people, when they write something, they'll be like, oh, well, I can't afford that. Or I don't have time to do that. Oh, I couldn't do that. I just went super big and wild and just let all of the thoughts process. And, you know, like you said in the introduction, things that kept coming back to me, it's like, well, you know, I really love traveling. I really love, you know, challenging myself and pushing myself because I'd gone on to, you know, I'd run London Marathon five times by that point. I'd done things like, like Tough Mother and, uh, you know, Backpack Solo around like Southeast Asia and um, cycled down Death Road in Bolivia and climbed Kilimanjaro and done all these awesome things. But the, almost like the, the other half of that equation was around motivating, inspiring women and girls. And it's something that I've noticed a lot throughout my career. So I think I was actually very fortunate because when I was 18 and took that gap year out traveling, that massively boosted my confidence. It was something that I could always reflect back on. So when I was like the only woman in the conference room or the youngest you know, woman trying to do something, I'd always think, Sarah, when you were 18, you traveled around Southeast Asia by yourself. You have got this. You can do this. And obviously, you know, working in banking is very male dominated, very sort of um, ingrown sexism and all of these sort of microaggressions that you sort of end up getting used to. And I would, I don't know, it would just sort of frustrate me a lot and realize that not everybody necessarily had my confidence. So I was trying, how can I encourage, you know, other, other women? How can I motivate them? How can I inspire them? And I think it's because I've always been very sort of a very action driven person, you know, mm. take action, see what happens, get the feedback, do it again. I've got no problem taking that, taking that first step. And so I wanted to combine, I suppose, all my passions and interests, that, 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 that challenge, that, that, um, that motivation, that inspiration. And that's what journaling allowed me to do to process. And I came up with you know, I wanted to build something which was, um, I wanted to be, to be able to be nomadic. I literally wanted to have a laptop and a mobile phone to be able to, to build a brand and a website to be able to run it from anywhere in the world. I, I did want to, um, to follow my, my passions and my interests, but I also wanted to be able to monetize it at the same time. So I always went, went in with sort of, you know, a business mindset. Yes, this is about following my passions, but it's, it can't just be a hobby. I've got to be able to, to monetize it at some point and be able to you know, sustain myself. I didn't quite know how I was going to do that, but that was, that, was the, that was the dream. And I remember writing one of my first blog posts I wrote, which was in May 2014, which literally goes into details. It writes, and people can read this blog post now. You know, what do I want to achieve with Tough Girl Challenges? What is the mission? What is the purpose? Um, and then, you know, broke it down even further. I then spent um, six months, I think you'll appreciate this. Um, I actually developed, I think it was more like procrastination. I was more worried about, you know, launching Tough Girl Challenges. But I wrote this like ridiculous business plan. It's like 200 pages. Like it's insane. <laughs> it's got like everything. It's like marketing and when I can employ people and what, how I would handle different situations and how I could monetize. And Top marks for my, effort. Yeah. <laughs> So much time and effort, but I think doing that made me feel as though I was being busy and being productive. But mm. now I look back, I think actually it was just a procrastination tech technique instead of actually launching my website. So I wrote this blog post in May 2014, mm. but I didn't actually launch the website until December 2014 okay. because I was so scared and worried. You know, what are people going to think? Like, who does she think she is to be able to to do this with her life? You know, so those were like the the nerves and everything else but yeah to come back to your original question um <laughs> journaling for me has been very very you know uh, powerful it's a great way to process and it's something that i'd recommend other people to do as well mm. do you still have the journal do i still have the journal uh, d no because um i i'm quite i'm quite minimalist and so oh, I, went, yeah. I went through um i go i go through stages where i literally go through everything and i look at it and i you know i've, I've appreciate it and think god this was amazing it really helped me and then i get rid of it <laughs> that's what i do but then i'm like oh i should have kept that for the record like <laughs> could have been used to that <laughs> now nah, fair you mentioned then um you tough girl challenges so there's i have a lot of questions here so i'm just stumbling over my words a little bit but i'd like to to start with where did the name come from tough girl challenges where's that come from what i wanted to do 
I know, God, this is, this is actually really fun talking about this because it, <laughs> it just, it takes me back when I was sort of trying to come up with the name. I basically, I wanted to combine something which was tough and, and feminine mm. as well, because I think if you're a, back then, you know, seven, eight years ago, and it's probably still like this now, it's almost like girls could only be one thing. You can't be pretty and smart. You've got to yeah. be either or. And, um, and I remember like people would be quite shocked when I told them certain things that I'd done and they'd almost like look at you like, you but you're such a you know I like the color pink and I you know like you know quite girly I used to be like um, a prop like proper blonde like you know like bleach blonde <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. when I say bleach blonde like you know nice highlighted lovely blonde highlighted hair and people sort of look at you sort of and a they think you're you're stupid and then you tell them like where you work and be like huh okay um so I wanted to to almost show girls that look you can be feminine and enjoy clothes and makeup and all of that other stuff but also you can enjoy going outdoors and getting sweaty and getting down mm. in the mud and just, you know, embracing like the feralness basically. And um, then it was just, um, I had this sheet of paper and I wrote down like all the different, you know, like names like girl, woman, um, femme, um, all these other different things. And then I wanted like tough or hardcore or, um, you know, badass, all these ones and trying to combine them together. And then obviously you've also got to check the social media to make yeah. sure that you can get like the social media <laughs> handles and which, and which names. And um, yeah, and, and Tough Girl Challenges just sort of ended up sticking out. And, and I just thought, yeah, this sounds great. And I, I think I went on, I might have gone on Fiverr to get somebody to design my logo. And oh my God, he sent me like 30 options. They're all really similar, but you know, Kate, like the capital T um, and the G and the C were like maybe done in black or something, or it was mm. black writing instead of pink. And my God, I spent weeks agonizing <laughs> over like the, the color and the logo and should it be, should it be mountain? Should it be something else? And then I think it eventually got to the point where it's just like, oh my God, you've got to make a decision. Just, just pick one. <laughs> pick one, move forward. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, and you know, what? I, I love it. Like I'm really happy with it. It feels very, it feels very, feels very me. <laughs> yeah it, it seems that I, I like that it you know the pink is consistent throughout as you say that's you and it's I was gonna say look at my bedroom <laughs> <laughs> exactly the color is my, consistent my diary <laughs> like I've, I've got so much pink stuff that's impressive <laughs> that's impressive <laughs> So you wrote your first blog then sort of breaking things down for yourself as much as anybody else who is going to going to join. You've got your domain name, you've got your website up and running um, or the blog up and running. And then the website maybe came with that. You mentioned you were feeling a bit nervous, like you had you had questions buzzing around. We've talked about you being quite a get up and go actionable person. Was this something that had a sort of higher level of anxiety attached to it? Or was this sort of a, a wavering and a wobble that you felt with a few things that you just got on with anyway? Uh, I think I've always felt it, but I think I've always just got on and done it and done it. Yeah. Like, oh, whatever, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be fine and worked it out. I think this time I was just more, it was more because it was like I was changing my identity mm. because my... Um, identity up until I suppose that point was very much related to the, the status and the ego that I got from working with you know a, a big a, a big bank a big, a big bank working in banking um or private wealth management and then suddenly it's like I'm going to be a motivational speaker I'm going to do adventures and challenges I'm going to write about them and people are going to be fascinated and want to hear all about it and um and I was just scared and worried about being judged and literally what, and, and by the way, these are people whose opinions I wouldn't necessarily care about, if that mm. makes sense. But, but I do. It's like, you know, my previous colleagues who I used to work with would now be like, well, what would they think of me? And I think that's, that's been a bit of a journey to get to that point where it's almost like it doesn't matter. Like you have got to live your life for you. Their opinions, you know, don't matter at the end of the day. Like, and I think I also got to that point. I think it was quite sort of a realization when I realized that, you know, not everyone is going to like you. And it was like, do you know what? That's okay. Because like, all I can be is, is be myself. And, um, and I think, especially like, I think people almost used to think I was like Marmite. People either loved me or hated me, um, which, you know, which is fine. But that's something I sort of dealt with quite a lot, like, especially sort of in my, in my early twenties. And then I don't know, in my thirties, I just sort of got to that point where well, maybe I'm just socializing with different people who did like me and appreciate me. Um, 
but yeah, it was definitely that that uh, being judged and scared of failure, and also I think doing something which people didn't really understand and didn't really appreciate. Like I do remember telling one of my friends, and and it was this by the way, this wasn't sort of it wasn't malicious. I think maybe it was just they didn't really understand or didn't know how to process. But I told them oh, I'm going to be you know a motivational speaker and go on these adventures and do these awesome challenges. And they sort of, they laughed in my face. And I still remember it, but it wasn't like, I, I, know, it, it, I know this sounds weird because um, they, they weren't malicious with it. It was just more like that was just their, their mm, response. Yeah. But it's something that's really stuck with me because it can really sort of hurt deep inside. Obviously you just sort of laugh it off, and blah, blah, blah. but it sort of stays with you and it starts, you know, that little pinprick of self-doubt. Well, actually, am I being stupid? Like, am I being ridiculous like is this feasible is this is this possible and and sometimes when you know I didn't know like to be honest I honestly I didn't know what was going to happen um you know how I was going to be able to make it work um I just knew that I needed to to try and to give it a go and so that's what I did and yeah it's been (laughs) it's been quite a journey like it has like ebbed and flowed and I've gone off in certain directions like well initially because I started blogging and Mm. I thought well everyone's going to love reading about what I write about and you know, no one read my blog <laughs> oh, that that's zero or one two <laughs> it's like Maybe. I have someone who's read it <laughs> yeah like no impact and I've got all oh, got like 10 followers on Instagram yeah. and then what's Twitter again and how do I tweet because you know, that's the thing I was starting from zero in yeah in, in everything and I just didn't really know what I was doing at all I was just sort of figuring it out but also I mean it was a hell of a learning curve and an amazing you know when I look back and think oh my god you, you know I built my website myself I figured out how to connect my social media channel I figured you know um I figured it out for me and um and it, it's been you know it's been pretty incredible when I look back but there's also been this is the thing like I always want to try and remember like the failures and the setbacks and the you know when things didn't go right because it's always very easy to to share like a glowing picture because you are also when you're a positive person you end up focusing on the yeah. the positive situations and, and yeah. what happened not all of the the challenges and everything else that that go that went in behind it but um but for me when things really started to change was when I started um you know started the podcast that's when things sort of really opened up for me mm. um but yeah there's definitely been setbacks obstacles failures mis- mistakes errors you know all the way along so it hasn't been this sort of linear journey it's definitely been yeah, up and down up and down, and down. yeah, yeah it's, it's it's good you mentioned that because it's the myth of the overnight success isn't it it's the daily grind of you're putting in the hours putting in the work keeping the social media all those pings coming through because in the early days it's like respond to everybody and 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 you know you've got to consume everything and put everything out all the time and it's it gets quite intense almost from self self-imposed deadlines and things like you know I, certainly that's what i found and um just before we, we jump into the podcast, so you started Tough Girl Challenges and, uh, you know, you come home from your travels, you, you'd set this thing up, you'd done all the, the paperwork, you'd got, you'd got the plan. Were you working at the same time, just part time, or was this literally your full time head in, let's get this thing done kind of endeavor? So initially when I started, oh, this is taking me back now, I so I'd moved back in with my with my parents and I should just say they're lovely and amazing. If you follow me on Instagram <laughs> stories, <laughs> you'll see it's, they're, they're brilliant to live with. So I, I know that I'm incredibly fortunate to be in that position. What did I start doing? Um, I didn't need, I was okay money wise because I didn't, all I needed to pay for, um, basically I had enough money in savings to you know, buy buy my laptop which I needed Hmm. uh cover my mobile phone bill and pay for my gym membership those were like my only outgoing costs because I didn't know (laughs) three priorities um and then obviously you know I had the money to pay for you know the domain name and the website hosting Hmm. and you know all of that so I didn't actually need any money at the start because I wasn't paying bills I wasn't paying rent I wasn't paying you know food so I was you know living at home and that was all fine but I did start um when I, I was going through my minimalist stage, which I mentioned earlier, and one of the things that I did was I started selling everything that I that I basically owned that I no longer needed. Christian Louboutin shoes? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's sell them. Uh, all you know, all my work dresses, work suits. You know, got rid of all of them. Uh, totally minimized everything. Sold stuff on eBay and thought, oh, maybe I'll become like a 
you know, I can do like eBay on the side, but that was just, uh, I mean, it's too bad. It did bring me in some money, which was great. I also got like a tax rebate as well, which was great. So, um, you know, so I was, I was okay. I think for the first, uh, year and year and a half mm-hmm. um but then the then the conversation started to change so, so like i said my dad's an accountant one of the questions he, he'd ask me is like so how are you going to make money like how are, you, how are you going to make money and at that point i was like i don't know i don't mm. oh you know I, I don't know um but at the same time as well i um have you heard of camp america yes yeah yeah so um i did camp america back when i was a student so i did it for three years when i was 18 mm. 19 20 and I became like a regional interior for Camp America. Mm. So I would have, it, to be honest, it's, it's fabulous. People come to your house, you interview them. So it's, you know, it's very, it's wonderful. You talk about camp for like 45 minutes and you write a report, but you know, you get paid for that. So I was doing that during, um, during most of the year. Um, and at one point, you know, I was, I was having like, I was seeing it's like four or five people a day, which was great. Mm-hmm. We used to have a little system <laughs> set up. So people would come in, dad would let them in the house and they would have a chair in like the living, um, like in the hallway so they could sit on that while I was interviewing the other person in the dining room. And then, you know, then we'd swap around <laughs> like, yeah, so that was pretty good. And then I was so, I, I had like odd jobs as well. So I used to, or well, I still do, but I just haven't done fast because uh, of COVID. But I sell silk top hats at Royal Ascot. So I'm like the Royal Ascot hat historian. Look at that. <laughs> I was not scary, expecting to hear fashion. that today. <laughs> yeah. So if you, ever, if you ever attend Royal Ascot, um, I'm normally there selling the silk top hat. So come and have yeah, a chat with me. Oh, but yeah, that's, um, that's, uh, that's a great little job to do for a week. You know, that brings in, you know, nice sort of chunk of change, which mm. is good. Um, so, so I, so yes and no, like I have, I've always done sort of odd jobs, but also the flip side of that is I have very, especially in the start, because I didn't do any traveling or adventures for quite a while, um, until, uh, basically, uh, I had enough money for my savings to pay for Marathon de Saabs as well. Yeah. So that was, um, which I did in 2016. So it was then 2017 that I needed to start earning, uh, money if that makes, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. So before that, like I didn't have, like, I didn't shop. I didn't, you know, I don't, I didn't buy DVDs. I don't buy music. Mm. I, I didn't, um, I would say no to everything. Like I did, I missed out on, uh, weddings and hen do's and, you know, other, when people say, Oh, do you fancy coming to do this? And I'll be like, Nope. <laughs> Cause, I, Cause actually, you know, for those, for those two and a half years, it was, it was really, um, you know, I was very conscientious of what little money I had. Mm. and the opportunity of cost of how I would spend that money Mm. so I was very um I was very very focused on the business the brand uh building up tough girl challenges investing in you know in in myself basically um yeah so on the flip side I didn't need to earn a huge amount of money yeah yeah no thank you for sharing that and it's 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 good to hear that you know because again it's sort of just breaking down what goes on behind the scenes in order to create something like this you know I think most people in the outdoor world who listen to podcasts will have stumbled upon your podcast and listened to it. And that is a segue into the podcast, which we'll jump into in a minute. But, you know, there's been a lot of work and, you know, dipping in with different things here and there and, 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 you know, finding your own way. There's, there's no program to follow with this stuff, is there? So no, thank you for sharing that. So I want to come to your adventures in a moment, all the awesome things you've done and the the crazy stuff that you've run and hiked. So we'll get to that. But let's jump into the podcast. So why did you decide to set up a podcast? Because you'd you'd produce a few little YouTube videos and stuff, I believe, up until this point. But why did you go down in particular the medium of audio? What was it about that that inspired you? And, you know, your goal, I believe, was to, to create more female role models you know in the, in the big wide world and i think you, you you have done and do that really really well um but how did this all start how did you find your guests how did you find your style and your flow and and walk us through all of that that'd be really good so it's actually it was a combination of things coming together so doing what i was doing you know trying to build this online blog this online website monetizing my my passions uh, i pretty much knew nobody Mm. um in my in my friendship group really where i live who was doing that and uh, a friend actually from camp america said look she she does something similar like over in australia but she was like a you know a singer straight musician she said why don't you join i've got this mastermind group there's three other people involved 
I'd love you to join. We're all sort of in this digital creative space, building our businesses at similar, similar times. So it was like me with the blog. There was another guy who had a podcast. There was um, this girl and there was somebody else. And we would meet up every every month and we talk about our goals and ambitions what we were doing you know basically having an accountability partner and one of the members of that group was this guy called Yanni Lunga um, and he had a podcast called 360 Entrepreneur and he was talking a lot basically saying oh you know because I was talking about blogging and, and writing because I thought that was the medium I was going to go down he said why don't you do um why don't you start a podcast and I was like I am not technical like I, <laughs> what even is a podcast like how do, how does this even work and um, I, I'd, I'd had a few sort of um, health, health problems and I ended up spending this sort of week trying to relax and recharge and re-energize. I was actually up in um, Port, Port Douglas in, in Australia. And I spent this week and I was like, right, let's, let's figure out this podcast thing. And I started listening to podcasts for this week and it was life changing because I, it suddenly really clicked for me like the power of the podcast like having this voice in your head and i was listening to hours and hours and hours of content you know making my breakfast listening to podcasts walking on the beach listening to podcasts and i'd be having i almost this i felt like this is going to sound really weird but i was in this like relationship with this podcast voice I've because been there. So <laughs> yeah because you, you know you're laughing at the same things and you've got yeah. the inside jokes and you're sort of like I don't, it's very strange and it really clicked for me then about the about the the power of being able to hear people's voices um the, the second thing that happened as well is I've been going into local girls schools to talk about you know challenge and change and pushing themselves and setting goals and I was talking to these young girls about their goals and ambitions and what they wanted to do. And I'll just never forget it. And, and a couple of these girl, girl, girls were saying that their goal was to become a wag, which in the UK is basically the wife and girlfriend of a footballer. Mm. Um, and for me, I was just like, I was, I was just heartbroken thinking these young girls are growing up and that's their am ambition. And why is that their goal? And then you start to look at who, who are the role models, who are the women out there, which women are getting, you know, e exposure in, in the newspapers. And I just thought, you know, hold, hold on, this is, this is crazy. And I remember coming home, telling my parents, and I opened up a paper, and I encourage people to, honestly, I say this every time, do this today, pick up a newspaper, go to the back pages, look at the sports pages, look for the women, look for the representation. And to be honest, it's not it's not there like there is a statistic I mean it was from like five or ten years ago now which says women basically get four percent of the media exposure and like 0.4 percent of the of the sponsorship mm. and so you know that was really weighing quite heavily on me because I thought you know you in order to to be if you've got to be able to see it in order to become it and I thought well if these young women and girls are growing up and they're not seeing women out there who are doing these incredible challenges who are traveling the world and sailing and rowing and doing these amazing sports and you know climbing mountains and doing triathlons and how can they know that this is an option for them and so, so that combined with with Jan's suggestion about the podcast uh, made me think and at the beginning of January 2015 which is when I started planning the podcast and it took me six months to, to get it out there um, I thought, okay, well, let's, let's give this, let's get, I love talking, <laughs> let's give this a go. Um, and I will figure it out. And I have to say, you know, I was very, you know, Jan, um, always want to give him props. You know, he gave me a lot of support um, in terms of doing a lot of encouragement. And I basically, you know, found the music, like listened to hours of music until I found something I liked. And I was like, oh, I love this little, the, you know, the, the beats of music, my intro and, um, I did like a, I ended up doing, oh, I feel awful now. You just triggered something in me when um, I did like an interview with somebody and she was great, but I was rubbish. And then I never used that interview. Uh, <laughs> no. I, like, oh, I think I ghosted her. But then I, you know, I started um, <laughs> reaching out to, to women that I'd been followed or what, you know, women who'd inspired me. So mm. it was like challenge Sophie, a woman called Sally Kettle, like an ocean yeah. rower. And I basically just reached out through, through their websites and was just like, hi starting a podcast this is my yeah this is my so hope cool. my i'd love to be able to to speak to you and you know, th these women very kindly gave gave their time and i did the first interview and oh my god like i just didn't know what i was doing um i think i i think i even like introduced it I, you know oh that was it i um so if you go back and listen to the first couple of episodes I don't introduce myself. I don't introduce the podcast. I don't tell anybody who I am and what I'm doing. It's literally just like, 
so today we're speaking to like for example like Abby Barnes and like and I took a friend listen it was like Sarah love you know very positive it was like love your work it's great however you've never actually introduced yourself or told anybody like your name or who you are or what you do and I was like oh my god like such a basic thing just to introduce like hi my name is Sarah Williams yeah um so you know lots of mistakes were made but I was also you know massively encouraged by you know friends who listen to the podcast and say oh this is you know fantastic and you know would give me honest feedback and um you know, I decided to read on a Tuesday, you know, tough girl, you know, tough yeah. girl, Tuesday, off the tease, I thought that was good. <laughs> 7 a.m., I love it, yeah, 7 a.m., because I thought, well, you know, it's a good, good way to start the day. And that's, that's how it's happened, and that's how it's, um, you know, evolved. Initially, I was um, reaching out to women. I was finding them a lot through social media, through Twitter, through, through blogs that I'd follow. You know, you, you find these lists of, you know, mm. ultra runners and sailors and adventurous women, and generally it was like, well, which are the women who inspire me? I want to speak to them. What questions do I, you know, it's very uh, sort of self-centered. Like, what do I want to know? Um, and started, yeah, started the podcast on the 4th of August, 2015 with four episodes. Been releasing consistently then every single Tuesday at 7 a.m. UK time. A um, couple of years into it, one of the, I thought it would be really fascinating to be able to go back and speak with the previous guests um, to see what they've been up to in the time since. So to almost have this like oral timeline, this oral history of what they've been up to, which I think is incredibly powerful because it's so easy for people to, to see people once they've climbed the seven summits, but where did they start? What was their journey? What was their process? Yeah. So I started Tough Girl Extra, which comes out on a Thursday at 7 a.m. UK time. And um, yeah, now there's, I've, I've also, by the way, I've messed up my numbering. So <laughs> I think it shows I'm up to like 370 episodes. But when I'm looked, I'm actually up to like 440 episodes because wow. I didn't number like the Tough Girl Extra episodes and I did like solo and bonus episodes. Oh, so it's all a bit... It's a lot yeah. to keep track of. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> it's a lot to keep track of. But, you know, it has been... It's been amazing to share these stories and get their voices out there and just the, the knock-on consequences of that mm. because I've had so many messages of people saying, oh, you know, I've, I've listened to this story and, you know, those words really resonated and because of that I signed up for a marathon or I left my job and decided to do something else or actually I decided to take the plunge and, and sign up for that trip to go climb that mountain. And, and that for me is what it's always, it's all about. It's that positive spiral yeah. because what happens when those women are like they go out and they see other women put, well, she's just like me she's a mum. she's got two kids or she's divorced or she's working a full-time job or she's in full-time education mm. and it's like well how are they doing it and then they go out and do it and then they inspire their friends their peers their colleagues and then they get encouraged to to sign up and take on a new challenge and step outside their their comfort sorry I could talk about this a lot <laughs> no I love it yeah. you know it's 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 just a massive congratulations for what you've achieved with the podcast it is spectacular and uh for for everyone listening um basically when I have a guest on, on the podcast I try and just do a little chat beforehand you know a week or so before and Sarah and I chatted last week I think it was and I just I told her a bit of my story and how I found Sarah and it, of course it was through her podcast and when I when I particularly when I was struggling with my mental health I'd sit on the rowing machine for hours and hours just trying to process my emotions and I'd, I'd have Sarah in the background you know listening to people adventuring all over the world I'd get to know you Sarah I'd get to know these people and it's like oh yeah my buddy Sarah and now it's like I'm actually talking to you and it's it's just so funny hearing about you like scrolling through people's website oh okay yeah I'll just email this person see if they want to come on the podcast and for me it was the same with you but I just it took me a very long time to click send so <laughs> but here we are today having this conversation so yeah it's it's funny being on on a somewhat similar journey you know um and, and hearing how you've got on with that so yeah congratulations on the podcast it's it's amazing what you're doing um and you certainly inspired me and I know so many other people as well so thank you for putting it all out there but um, the podcast is now up and running. You've got your Tuesdays, you've got your Thursdays, you've got the talks that you're doing, um, you've got your adventures. But I'd like to hear from, from you, broken down, what does a day-to-day -day running of Tough Girl Challenges look like? Oh, I always want to show you my spreadsheet. So <laughs> oh, man, spreadsheets. Uh, oh, spreadsheets. <laughs> um, so initially at the start, it was very, uh, I think I'll just give you this bit of context. Initially at the start, it was full on. It was intense. It was long day, sat on your laptop, sat on, like you said at the start, sat on social media. You need mm. to respond to every comment, respond to every DM, respond to every email. You need to be producing content, putting content out there. Um, and I went 
full in. I, I used to be very unbalanced. I'm a lot more balanced now, but I'm, I'm almost like, I'm not, I don't even like saying this, but I used to be very extreme, like in very, what I do, how I do it, all or nothing, 110%. And that's what happened with, with Tough Love Challenges, with, um, uh, with, the, with the blog, with the podcast, with the social media, with following people, engaging with people, building my networks, connecting on LinkedIn, you know, uh, a lot of time, to be honest, spent in my bed, my office, uh, working on a laptop and mobile phone. Um, didn't I used to feel incredibly guilty if I was doing something which wasn't related to growing my brand and growing my business. So mm. if I would stop to, you know, watch Netflix, it would literally be like, no, Sarah, like what? You, you don't have time to watch Netflix. That's an hour and a half that you could be spent on your business. You're not making any money. What are you doing? Get back to work. Uh, this, by the way, this is not how you should work. But I think initially in the start, I was so, I don't want to use the word desperate, but I was so uh driven, driven by wanting yeah, yeah driven to mm. to achieve something and and i was very scared of saying no to anything so i was saying yes to everything because i was almost like you know throwing so much stuff at the wall to see what was going to stick what was going to work and figuring out you know what worked for me what didn't work for me you know whether it was going on radio stations giving talks at schools giving talks for charities you know doing online stuff you know figuring this all out so uh this i will answer your question <laughs> oh good <laughs> So I ended up massively basic, and at the same time, uh, which links in with the challenges, I decided to do Marathon de Saab as a way to sort of launch myself onto the adventure scene by undertaking this big physical endeavor. Um, so I was training really, really ridiculously hard. I was, it was almost like, I want to say a prof professional athlete, you know, like <laughs> training twice a day, protein shakes, supplements, afternoon naps, massages, you know, all, all that jazz. But I basically ended burning myself out and towards mm. the end of the year um it's it's funny to think about i was still putting out these you know motivational quotes and you know uh, sharing content but i was exhausted i was run down i was tired burnt out i had um like severe chronic fatigue i was severely anemic like my i'd lost a ton of weight my period had stopped like my hair was falling out i had horrendous oh, acne over my face and my shoulders i was a, a, a wreck to be honest and so before you're allowed to do MDS, you need to get a doctor's letter and they need to do like an ECG and all this sort of stuff. I couldn't get sign off from my doctor because I just wasn't in a, in a healthy state at all. Mm. Um, so I had to postpone doing Marathon de Saabs to, to 2016. And I basically ended up taking 2015 to, to recover, which is when I ended up starting you know, the podcast and yeah. I had that time away to, <clears throat> excuse me, to, to reflect and end up getting better. Now, day to day, what does it look like now? I didn't have systems back then. I didn't really know what I was doing. It was very much figuring it out as I went. Now I'm at that point where I know what I'm doing. I know my processes. I know what the full journey is from finding a guest on social media to following them, to reaching out to them, to booking the interview, to editing the interview, to producing the artwork, to you know, producing the social media content, to writing the show notes, to getting it edited, to backup copies and Dropbox. There is a whole process which has basically been, um, been written out. The other thing I started to do as well was to batch content. So mm -hmm. in 2017, I headed off to through Height Appalachian Trail. But the only reason I could do that is because um, at the beginning of the year, I spent like five to six months preloading content. And this was only like one episode a week. Um, which if anyone's it's a massive that, feat of achievement oh. i'm sorry but man can we have an appreciation moment <laughs> but it, it was it's it was huge and so that was a big part of it like so me figuring out how i could go on these adventures while still enabling content to come out so i preloaded three months content like i think i was just relieved to be on the appalachian mm. trail um because that was all day every day editing because i was also you know, back in 2017, I was just so much slower at everything because it was all still so new and I was still, and I was still learning. Whereas now, you know, my process is in 2021. I am, I want to say like a machine and just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so efficient. Um, I, you know, like things like Facebook, you can schedule six months in advance. So that's what I, you know, I'll sit down for like half a day. And, you know, so at the moment there's my Appalachian trail videos are coming out. Then after that, it will be the Camino vlogs after that, the Lyceum way vlogs. But so I've got consistent content coming out. Um, I've also improved things. So for example, when I did the Appalachian trail, 
I didn't really share anything on Instagram or my socials because I, I, I vlogged it. And so, you know, I produced video content of that trip, but nothing really on IG stories, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Whereas now when I go on adventure, I have templates and this is good because I ha you have to be that organized because every day I know I need to take at least 10 photos I need to write copy I need to share that on Instagram which will get shared out to Facebook that then needs to be shared on um, LinkedIn medium and you can also share on like YouTube in the community place but you also need to film bits as well for to create the vlog for the day um, so there's and there's quite a lot to 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 remember and so I literally do have a spreadsheet where I'm like and I put little circles in like how or little ticks it's like how have I done this for the challenge so I can properly share the challenge and not miss out and especially that's um, even more important when you start working with brands and sponsors because you, you've got to produce that that content on a regular basis so now I I have systems I have um, I have a spreadsheet uh, which you follow me on Instagram stories you'll see um, and I batch produce. So I will have, so for example, at the end of May, I will do two weeks where I will interview up to 30 guests in those two weeks. And then I spend the next sort of two months editing um, and scheduling. And because I, I now release two episodes a week, uh, I, I work sort of three to four months in advance. That's the only way that I can do it. But it catches up so quickly. Like I, I get to that point where I'm like, yes, I'm finally like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm six weeks ahead. And then suddenly it's like, Oh, five, four, three. Oh no. I was like, I've got to get the next, next load out. So, um, so no, oh, sorry. Yes. Day to day. What's my life look like today? Today. I don't wake up. I don't, I wake up naturally. I don't set an alarm. Um, I have a master to-do list, which I keep, but then the night before I go to bed, I write a very sort of short to-do list with like maybe three or four things that I want to do. I also changed, um, how I produce and share my social media content. So I'm a big follower of Gary Vaynerchuk. Have you, have you heard of Gary Vaynerchuk? Vaguely, can you can you dive in a bit deeper? Yeah. Then? Oh my god. Okay. But he's amazing, and like this is like all all my marketing, all my social media strategy is basically Gary Vaynerchuk. He's this New Jersey entrepreneur. Took his father's wine business from like you know a six million turnover to like a sixty million turnover. But he really resonates and connects with me with what he shares and how he shares it. He's very very practical, and I was struggling initially at the beginning because I was always asking myself. Well, what what content should I share? What are you trying to think of content? And um, he changed it all from where he said, um, basically document, don't create. So it's just document your life. And that for me was like, mm. amazing. And that's, that's what cool. I started. That's what I've done for years now. Like if I was, I literally just Instagram stories. What am I eating? Where am I going? Like, what are my parents up to? Like, oh my God, so the other day, um, I came back in from, from the gym and, oh no, I came back in from a walk um like a like quite like a six mile walk my parents were outside sat on this nice wooden bench eating scones so when i got my scone um like oh sat you're down a on the scone bench. person i'm a scone, scone. person well, <laughs> I actually saying that on the story i actually do say scone and scone okay, um, but basically sat down on the bench the bench ended up breaking but like that's oh, the God. sort of <laughs> But that's the sort of thing that I will share on like my Instagram stories. Like, oh my God, we've broken, you know, broken our, our bench. And so I literally just document what it is that I'm doing. So when I did my, um, this, did my training to become um, a, a personal trainer, you know, I shared that, shared that journey when I was doing my, uh, oh my God, people will probably hate this time of my life. When I was, I was in 2017, I did my master's in women and gender studies. And so all I was sharing was being back at uni, reading and dissertations. Like I, I literally felt a collective sigh when I finished my dissertation because everybody who'd been watching were like, finally. <laughs> because it, sometimes all I'm sharing is like, it's me working from my bed. Um, so I just document my life, but my life is um, day to day. I try and make it very relaxed. I try and make sure I do some form of exercise during the day. I wake up naturally, do a couple of hours work, go to the gym, come back, have a protein shake, have a shower, do a couple more hours work. Um, chill chat with the parents um watch them watch them netflix um relax read a bit of a book do a couple more hours work basically what i feel like doing and what needs to be done mm. um that's what i do but i've also i'm at that point now where because my systems are so slick they're just i've got the momentum so i just know i just have to keep the momentum going so it's a lot easier than starting anything from a fresh if that makes sense got it now that's ac yeah, thank you for sharing that it's, it's good to hear sort of how you've got to that place as well and what works for you, that systems management and, and getting that customer flow as well with um, getting everything out. So no, I really like that. 
So you have mentioned the Marathon de Saves, you've mentioned the Appalachian Trail, we talked about the London Marathon, which you had done five times by this point. I want to talk more about the adventure type of stuff. So the Marathon de Saves, six days, six marathons across the desert, across the desert. Sarah, why, why did you do this event? What oh. drove you to do this crazy endeavour? <laughs> I think because I was talking about adventure and challenge so much and encouraging, you know, wanting to encourage other women and young girls to get fit and active and to travel and explore and to step outside their comfort zone, it made me realize that I'm talking about this, but actually when was the last time that I stepped outside my comfort zone? And I honestly couldn't remember. And you know, one thing when you, you know, for example, what you know, mentioned the marathons, I'd run the London marathon like five times. And so that distance was a very, comfortable distance for me it's like yeah I can run you know 26.2 miles that's absolutely fine and so I didn't really get those butterflies in my stomach you know that, those nerves and that excitement and I think I'd forgotten what it felt like to step outside my comfort zone and so it made me think well how can I help other people step outside their comfort zone if I don't know what it's like anymore to be in that place where you feel nervous unsure yeah. anxious and I thought well I need to have those feelings so I can process them work through them and then share what I've learned to hopefully enable people to, to pick and choose bits to help them overcome their, you know, their, their fears that they have. And I, I remember hearing about the Marathon de Saabs, like the first time I, I heard it, I was like, that is insane. Like, how is that even humanly possible? Like through the desert, through the sand and the sand dunes and the heat um, and the, hum you know, all, all of that sort of stuff. And um, to be honest, it, it scared me. But it also excited me in the say at the same time where I thought, you know, can I do it? Could I could I train myself? Could I could I be fit enough? Am I tough enough to do it? And I thought, well, you know, there's only one way to find out, and that's to actually actually do it. And I thought, you know, I had um, I, I think I had like maybe four thousand, four and a half thousand pounds left of like my of my savings, and I thought, well why not? Let's do Marathon de Saabs. It's a massive challenge. It would be an incredible way to launch what I'm doing to sort of step out into the adventure, into the adventure world. And yeah, signed up for it. I, you know, um, was meant to do it in 2015, obviously delayed till 2016, but it was in, in an incredible experience. Um, and for me, I think one of the highlights was actually even just getting to the start line mm. because I felt that that was almost like drawing a line in the sand. Yes, yeah, so I just, so I changed who I was and I started to identify more as an adventurer. I wasn't this lost soul anymore who was previously worked in you know, the banking industry. And so when I arrived on the start line, my goal was to get to the start line, fit, strong, healthy, which is what I did. And um, so it's almost like, I feel as though my life, it was like before MDS and then after MDS, because that's when it changed because I'd spoken to quite a few people who'd done it and I'd heard like quite a few horror stories and people who'd, who'd hated it and it being, you know, utterly horrendous and, you know, things like their feet, like the soles of their feet being <laughs> torn off and their blisters and like, oh, do not go Wonderful. actually get Google Marathon de Saab's feet if you want to see <laughs> disgusting feet. But um, yeah, I, I love the whole thing, this opportunity to connect with like-minded individuals, to, to be in this environment. I, I love the heat as well. So I'm like a big one for, for heat. Like, absolutely I can't love say it. I relate it. But... <laughs> <laughs> but it was just incredible. I, I think for me, one of the scary days was, um, was the long stage where you have to run like 52 miles in a day. And that was so far outside my comfort zone and, and my mind as well. You know, I, I, I sort of thought, well, I know I could probably get to about 30 miles. Like that would be good. But um, on that day, like I got past 30 miles, like 33 miles. And I was, this top, I was at the top of this sand dune and I was looking down and I tight, I remember tightening up my backpack stripes, have backpack st straps, um, having some salt tablets, having a sip of my water and just thinking, this is what you have trained for. Like, this is what it's all about. And like, if you could just picture in, you know, you're out in the desert and you're just running downhill on sand dunes. And I just felt like this badass. I was like, oh my God, I'm just so amazing. <laughs> and um, I just thought, well, this continues. You know, what a way to finish this 52 milers. And, you know, eight miles later, when I was suddenly at like 38, 39 miles, I like hit a wall, not a literal <laughs> wall in the desert, like a yeah. big wall. And, um, and it was like, you know, the pain in my body and then the self-doubt crept into your mind. Like, what are you doing, Sarah? Like, everything is hurting. You know, it's, it's starting to go dark now. You've still got like another 12 miles to go. Other people are stopping at the checkpoints. You know, why do you want to 
why are you continuing on and so that's when you start learning lessons about yourself because you start reflecting back about your self-talk what you're saying to yourself you start using gratitude and for me it was like hold on this is a choice that you have made about the life that you want to be living you know you chose to be here you paid a lot of money to be here to experience this so you know embrace it enjoy it just you know yeah appreciate these feelings that you're going through and how you're testing your body and your mind and um and and then the hallucinations start <laughs> oh, <fun. laughs> or they, or you can see like i don't know why i'm doing this but you can see like the camp and and it looks so close it literally looks like you can touch the camp the end point and then you realize you, you still got like another four hours to, to go to get there but i remember i crossed the finish line it was like april 14th there's a photo on my instagram where i blow a kiss to the camera and i just run 52 miles and I honestly, I had the most, the biggest high ever. I was like, oh, I, I felt immense. Like I, I remember just feeling just strong and healthy and powerful and just like the endorphins were off, must have been flying. And then you collect your water, you have some sweet tea. And then I, you know, it's walking back to, uh, back to my tent where I was sleeping that night. And on the, by literally crossing the finish line and walking to my tent, my body had just disintegrated. <laughs> oh, <shit>. <laughs> <laughs> I got to the tent and I just couldn't lie down anywhere. I was in so much pain. And that's the only time I wanted to press, like we have like an SOS button on your tracker, mm. but I wanted to press the, the help button. Um, but it was, it was joyous and amazing. And I think whenever you set like a big goal, which is outside your comfort zone, and then you work really hard to achieve it, and you, you know, you break it down to the physical, the mental and, and the logistical, and then you actually achieve it. I think it just proves something to yourself. You're like, you know, hold on. I have done this, you know, mm. I've worked really hard to make this happen. And um, I don't know, I felt like a weight lifted off my shoulders after I finished because I felt like I, I could call myself like an adventurer, like I could call myself like a runner. I felt like I had the chops, you know, I was tough. I was, um, you know, this person that, that I wanted to be. I was actually living this, this life. So um, Marathon de Subs was an incredible, incredible experience yeah, but again yeah i wish i documented it better i wish i'd taken like you know gopro and filmed it and you know i think i've got like two little clips uh I, you know I've, I've hardly got any photos from it just because that i just didn't know how to to share the, mm. the journey sort of visually through through film and through social media like i wrote about it and stuff and obviously talked about it more um but these are i suppose the lessons that you learn so yeah, yeah. you have the the memories in your mind though and that's pretty I precious do, so, i do yeah. and there are actually individual solo episodes as well where i think my a friend interviewed me about the experience and it's quite yeah, um cool. quite recently after it so um, people can hear more about the planning the preparation and stuff like that mm, i have to go and look at that that sounds really good you know what i like about this story in particular is the the length of the journey you know you having almost your burnout having to shift things move it back a year and you know I can have to say I can really relate you know to you up to that point with just like you've got to say yes to everything you're just life is like manic you're busy because you're meant to be busy you're successful but that's because you know you're, you're putting in the hours you can't give yourself the downtime and it's it's tricky isn't it you get hung up on numbers and your title and what you put out there and it almost becomes a mask and it's it's a very fine line to walk on but as you say like almost all of that was the built up to you getting out into the desert pushing your body again physically but that's the amazing thing with our bodies isn't it is they can achieve fantastic feats of endurance but we have to listen to them we have to nourish them we have to take care of them we have to rest them um, and I, I can imagine you had to have a, quite a bit of a rest after completing the MDS, eh? <laughs> Plus, I went straight back to the gym, which Did was you? actually, oh. yeah, it's like, well, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's cool. But you know, it's what it, you mentioned about documenting and, and your journeys and your travels. And, and next up, you, you jumped on the AT Appalachian Trail over 2000 miles. I'm um, in the United States, one of the, the longest trails in the world. And you just, you just, you know, yomped that absolutely fine. And you, you vlogged that. You've got your videos on your YouTube channel. I have to say, I've really enjoyed them. Um, I had a proper little laugh. I, we were putting that cream on. What was it? Like bike cream or something. And then you found out it was horse cream. And I was like, that's just brilliant. I love that. And, and what's so cool, Sarah, about all of this is you're just you. You know, you're just an ordinary human in the nicest possible way, you know. But so am I. And so is everybody listening. We're just us and the, with the right support with the right drive with the right training and motivation and belief in ourselves we can get out and do anything and that's what's really 
good and, and powerful about what you're doing when you're documenting and telling your story. As you say, it's, it's don't create just, what was it? Don't create just Do- um, document, document. Don't create. Exactly. So do- document your life, share yeah. your life, what you're doing and take yeah. people on the journey with you. Yeah. That's it. And I love that. So it, it it's working, you know, um, so to so tell us about the AT then give us a real brief run through. You did it hundred days. Um, how did it go? Highs and lows. Well, I, sh- I should just share like one of the reasons I picked the, the Appalachian trail was because after I finished the marathon de Sables and I got this, you know, got the medal around my, around my neck, crossed that finish line. I had maybe 10, 20, possibly 30 seconds of like pure joy and happiness. I was like, Oh my God, you know, yay me, yay me. And then my brain went, right. What's next? Mm. Like, forget about that. Let's move on. And that honestly, it, because it happened so quickly, I thought, hold on, I can't live my, and it, I think till that point I'd been, I, I still am a very goal focused person, but it was almost like I could only have happiness once I'd achieved my goal, once I'd reached that point. And it really made me stop and reflect and think you've worked for 18 months, literally to get to this point. And then you've almost dismissed it in 30 odd seconds. And it made me think, I can't, you don't, that's not a way to live your life. And so for me, then it came about, well, okay, well, how can I get that sense of joy and happiness, which I experienced at the end of MDS? How can I have that all the time? Not all the time, but you know, 80, 90% of the time, that's mm. what I wanted to be feeling. And, um, and I thought to myself, well, it's, it's about, it's not just about the goal. It's not just about the end point. It literally is about the journey. And I decided on my next challenge, because I didn't want to train for 18 months for it to be over within a week. So I almost wanted to flip it and do shorter amount of training and have a longer journey. And I, I discovered the Appalachian Trail and, you know, most people do walk it in like five and a half, six months. And to be perfectly honest, when I heard that, it, it excited me. Like I thought it would be an amazing experience to do, but it also didn't feel like a challenge to me. And this, mm. that, that maybe is like a little bit arrogant, but I was just like, like, I, yeah, I, of course I could walk the Appalachian Trail, like no problem, five and a half months easy and um and I was still going through this you know I want to challenge myself and I heard about another guy I think his name is Bigfoot and he'd done the Appalachian Trail in 100 days yeah. and I was like oh well if he can do it in 100 days I can do it in, <laughs> I can do it in 100 days and then that scared me and excited me because I was like oh 22 miles a day 100 days no rest days is this possible carrying everything you need doing it solo doing it unsupported figuring out your resupply and I got that excited buzz and thought, mm. oh, now this makes it interesting. <laughs> yeah. and, um, uh, and then adding in with the fact that, you know, Tough Girl Challenges were still so new, I couldn't take off five and a half months and just leave nothing behind. And I thought, well, a hundred months, that's roughly, uh, sorry, a hundred months, a hundred days <laughs> is roughly about, <laughs> yeah, that'll be a long time, long um, <laughs> would be about three months. And I thought, well, okay, can I preload three months worth of content? And it was like, yes. So things started to come together. Then, the, then, then two, or three, two, or three, two other things happened. One, my birthday's in September, September 10th. Um, and I haven't been a massive fan of my birthday for quite a while. So I thought, okay, well, how can I reframe this, make, you know, change this? And I thought, well, maybe I could finish the Appalachian Trail on my birthday. So then it's not really, you know, it's taking the pressure off having fun on my birthday. It's like, it's yeah. more of a celebration of that achievement. And I decided to go back to university for my masters and that course started in October. So I knew I needed to be back in September. Then it was my best. And then I worked it backwards and suddenly like, right, June 3rd, that gives me enough time. You know, if I can get a visa, which I got in January, then it gives me January, February, March, April, May, yeah, five months to preload three months worth of content, mm. trade and get a fit. And then the plan just came to, yeah, the plan just came together. And I mean, I look back now and think I was actually very naive, very naive, like, <laughs> I, I had this conversation with my sister because the Appalachian Trail run, there's a train station um, uh, which, uh, which can take you into New York City. It's like a 45 minute train ride into New York. Yeah. And I remember having this conversation with, with Caroline saying, you know, yeah, I think I'll be ahead of schedule and I'm sure I'll just be able to like take hop on the train and pop to New York, have a day in New York, then pop back and get on the wow. trail. Yeah. <laughs> ambitious. I, <laughs> ambitious. I don't think I realized, I understood the, the physical side and the, or I thought I understood the physical side and the mental side. I had no idea about the emotional side. That was something that came towards the end. Um, and obviously, you know, I, I did train for it and I, mm. you know, I did everything which I thought was, was correct. Um, but it was, 
it was brutal. It was mm. very brutal. And it, if you, I mean, it's also funny. <laughs> But if you watch, like, I mean, I did lose, I lost so much weight. Like, yeah. looking at it now, like, I am skeletal towards the end. Like, there's no, there's no muscle, there's no body fat. Um, just, and mentally as well, um, one of the biggest challenges was feeling like a failure every single day. And I know that sounds really, uh, really interesting. But because, by the way, you know, choice again i've chosen to do my this challenge i've chosen to put myself in this position so you know it's all on me which i'm i'm fine with i take full responsibility but it's interesting because on day one you don't start out doing the full distance every day you sort of build up to it so day yeah. one i did 15 miles day two 30 miles but then suddenly i'm 14 miles 15, behind. So 15 miles so, and then 30 miles so 15 miles on day one 15 miles on day two i was gonna so say yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was like, that's quite a big jump. jump. You, you're okay. taking that. <laughs> Fair. Okay. 15 miles each day. Yeah. And then, you know, instead of hitting the 22 mile target, so then I'm, you know, seven miles behind on day one, uh, plus another seven, so 40 miles day Got two, it. and so on and so forth. Oh, gosh. And, um, the numbers. And start, yeah, the numbers. <laughs> yeah. And I got to the halfway point, 50 days in, I'd had one rest day, I covered a thousand miles. And I still had 1,200 miles to go in the same amount of time. Mm. But at that point, I was also getting weaker. Mm. And, and it was just like, I had, like, is this possible? And then you start doubting yourself. Like, even if I try my best, and I am trying my hardest, I'm trying my absolute best, what if I fail? Yeah. Like, really difficult and interesting questions. Because if I hadn't, have, if I'd still summited Mount Katahdin, but maybe done it on the 11th of September, like, I, I had to I, I still don't quite know the answer I don't really want to admit it like would I would I class that as a success or class I was that gonna as a failure? ask what what if you fail what if you you know it's funny because I'm, I'm very I'm very interested in this because I have very commonly been caught up by the numbers game you know the time the pressure and for me I found it's a very double-edged sword as to whether I really thrive with that pressure because like you I like I like things to be tough I would like to push myself like I, I'm I go on the trail and I expect a challenge you know I did the Tour de Mont Blanc most people take 11 days I did seven because I was I was just buzzing and I loved it and I had the energy and I pushed myself but then there's other times where actually you know I want to take my time I don't want to rush the miles and knowing I have to do 26 28 30 miles just frustrates me and were you sort of dancing with that a little bit or well I mean it sounds like it because you reach that halfway point and you're you're, you've, you've just walked a thousand miles. Can we just have a moment of appreciation for that? You know, but you're instantly looking ahead, questioning whether you even have a right to be there to a degree because you're not doing it necessarily in the way that you want to because you want to hit that hundred days mark, you know? So the second half then, was it a bit of a head down, get it done? Or was it, was it, was it enjoyable? This is the interesting thing. So there is, um, there is a six minute video on YouTube, which has been watched like 75,000 times. And to be honest, most people prefer or like to see the hardship. They like seeing the tears mm. and the twisted ankles and the, the, the emotional aspects of it. And obviously I try to cram in a, a hundred day footage of a, dog, a daily vlog into like a six minute video, which is very emotional. There's lots of tears. But, and at one point, there's quite a lot of comments like, oh my God, did you enjoy it? Did you enjoy it? And the thing is that I loved it. It was yeah. amazing. And I, I am actually, like I've said before, you know, I am actually a really positive person. So um, I'm also very, if I need a good cry, let it out. And I'm just sort of like, like <laughs> allow, <laughs> yeah, like allow to allow myself to process these emotions. But I've also, I can reflect on releasing the tears and just being like, well, you know, this is just how I'm feeling. And then like sort of, the great thing when you're walking in outdoors in nature, you have this reflection time on it. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I, it made me doubt myself, it made me think, hold on, did I not enjoy the Appalachian Trail? And so I actually rewatched my vlogs from the beginning to see, A, how many times like I cried and how emotional it was. And it's like less than seven times or, you know, like it's very, um, it, it's not all the time. So I did enjoy it. It was, it was an incredible experience. I think um, it was a case of, it was a case of put your head down and go, but it was more a case of I have to show up even when I don't want to, yeah. which I actually think is a really valuable lesson because it is. especially in the world of social media, 
um, people are very willing to show you their highlight reel. They're very willing to show you at the summit and at the end and the glorious views and when the sun is shining and the birds and the butterflies and the ponies and the horses. But how many people actually show video of when you know, you, you've vomited, you've just sort of shot yourself, mm -hmm. um, you, you haven't been able to find camping, you've eaten your last Snickers, um, you've just slipped over and ripped your pants, you've fallen in the mud and you can't get out because you're like a turtle with your, you know, your legs in the air. Um, you know, not every day is going to be a good day. You're yeah. going to have the, the blisters and putting on oh my god like anybody like putting on cold wet clothes those oh first, man like, it's so sad it's such a sad experience it's oh. just it's just hold your breath get it done and get moving as quickly as possible <laughs> that's a mental challenge though, oh it like is every morning it is and also to get out of your tent yeah when you are warm and snug yeah. like sometimes the only thing that would get me out of my tent is because i needed the toilet and so yeah. that would literally be about <laughs> like oh my god and as soon as you get out de decrease the uh, the thermo rest um so there was lots of like valuable lessons in there but especially like the, the showing up like mm. um and i actually one of the reasons i wanted to document every single day is is to be really realistic about what it is like to take on these challenges to show people i mean i know it's quite an extreme version but to show people what it is like because i think so many people go in with blinkers on and yeah. they just they, they're just they focus so much on the positive and and not necessarily the the other situations that they could end up being in so um i think i've gone off topic so no, sorry <laughs> I, I think that's that's really important you know because I don't know films like Wild. Obviously, that's for the Pacific Crest Trail. But Bill Bryson, you know his book, and yeah. you might he didn't finish the AT. But regardless, like you get these these media outputs and these stories of of these long longer trails, and they they almost become cinematized and glorified. And the reality is, there's blood, there's sweat, there's tears. It's hard. It's tiring. It's it's draining. You lose weight. Your body starts to break down. Your mind starts to break down. Yes, you love it. But that is, that's the price you pay, you know, to be out there and walk for three to five months. And there's a lot of uncertainty and you're facing fears, like whatever your fear is, some people might, oh, I'm worried about encountering bears. I'm worried about encountering people. I'm worried about where I'm going to pitch my tent. I'm worried about water, food, um, hitchhiking, yada, 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 like endless list of things. And you might step out of day-to-day -day life, which has its, its mental challenges too, but the trail have that, has its own as well. But I, I like that you you share this because this is the truth. This is reality. This is the journey. And, and the trail is such a metaphor for life. That's something I say very often. And, you know, you learn so much about yourself. I have to be honest, I'm holding back on the questions about the AT because I could absolutely pick that entire experience apart. I want to know about the charging and everything. But <laughs> I want I want to keep this as a rounded conversation today. Yeah. And maybe we'll chat about that another time. So let's just zoom out. Obviously, you've done a lot since the AT. The, the Tough Girl Challenges is, is growing. It's, it's doing awesomely. Um, how have you got through COVID? How did 2020 treat you? Well, 2020. Oh, well, 2020 was... So I was actually in, um, in Australia. So 2019, just to, to almost like follow it through, I'd done... Um, uh, I'd finished the, this... By the way, this sounds incredible when I, when I share the next 15 months. And I don't want people... I mean, this is almost like the new norm, but 2019 mm. for me was, uh, which does the in 2020, was an incredible year because everything started to come together for me. Bearing in mind, this has been four or five years in the making, but, but 2019, I had, um, I'd cycled the Pacific Coast Highway. I'd ended up in Cabo San Lucas and I'd flown, my brother lives in Melbourne. So I'd flown there over to Melbourne for Christmas at 2019. Uh, yeah, 20, yeah. yeah sorry, the beginning of 2019. Got it. And then uh, had, uh, spent uh, time in Australia. I then flew over to India. I did my yoga teacher training qualification. So 200 hours of yoga, which was incredible. I then came back to the UK. I did my personal training qualification. Um, I then ended up doing a sponsored hike to go and hike the Camino Portuguese um, in September, October. I then got invited by a friend to go and walk the Lycian Way in Turkey. I finished that. I came, you know, uh, head, headed home. And then I flew off to Australia again. Um, to start 2020 and then I was doing a sponsored hike with Cicerone on the overland track mm -hmm. so I that was just amazing like everything was coming together like the hikes the adventures the sponsorship the podcast it, the podcast had won a couple of awards at that point so um yeah 2020 I just hiked the overland track 
I'd had, I've got like three or four more sponsored hype books in. My year was looking amazing. I was back off to India to go and do, um, to go and do yin yoga teacher training. And I was flying back to the UK around March 13th, 14th or 15th around that time. And it was really, yeah, very, very strange. So flew back in and then I don't know how long I had before lockdown, before lockdown came in. Mm. Uh, to, to be honest, like I, I am, in, I am very fortunate, very privileged. You know, I, like I said, I, I do live with my, my parents. I live right by the beach. We've got a nice sized garden. Everything that I do pretty much work. So there's almost two halves of the business, you know, the, the adventure half and then the, the podcast Patreon half. And so I, it allowed me to focus purely on the, on the podcast and Patreon and the website while the adventures were all paused and halted. And to be honest, I was pretty fine, like, especially during the summer months, like not a problem. I'm, you know, I did a lot of reading, Netflix, wrote massive long to-do lists about what I was going to do and then looked at them, didn't do them, realized I was never going to do them. <laughs> the time for me, things started to get really tough uh, later on in the year. Uh, September, October, November, December, because I am not good in winter in the UK, like at all. Like it just, uh, it, I, I don't know. Like I don't want to say I suffer from that SAD thing, but I just really struggle when it is dark mm -hmm. and miserable. And for the past four, four or five years, I've been in Australia for. So I haven't had a, I haven't had a winter. Oh, maybe yeah, I haven't had a winter like since 2018 or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, January 2020, I really struggled. Like mm. it was just, uh, and by the way, do not do this. So I, um, <laughs> Chicago, <laughs> I discovered like Chicago PD or Chicago Med or Chicago Fire. Okay. And I started watching one episode and then I just binge watched all, <laughs> like they've all got like eight series. But then I also sort of, I basically gave myself permission to be like, do it, Sarah, this is how you're feeling. That's mm. fine. I did try and continue doing my, you know, to do some, you know, to do some exercises, to do some yoga, to do some weightlifting but I massively, yeah, massively struggled. February, I just felt sad. And I remember I was lying on my bed and I just like, just like, I don't know, just like this little tear coming, coming down. Um, yeah, I was just like, oh. <laughs> and then it was, I did have like a, woe me, woe me. And, but then I do have to, you know, I put things in perspective all the time. And I, I know it's not about comparison because you know, every single person has, has gone through a huge amount during this time. You know, no, no one hasn't been affected. So um, I, I very often to come back to you, you know, look how lucky I am, um, you know, food on the table, you know, my own space, you know, Wi-Fi, you know, all of these amazing things are very, very um, privileged and lucky. So yeah, it's, I'd say it's been, it's been, it's been tough. It's had its ups and its downs. Um, but it, but it also did make me realize at one point I literally have no life at home. Like, mm. <laughs> so when I, when I'm at home, I, the only places I go to, I go to my gym and I go to my local coffee shop where I wash dishes. Like that's like, and this is all in like a, you know, like an eight minute radius. Like that's wow. like, I don't have like a social life. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't go out. Um, because normally I'm not here for that, mm. for that long. It's normally like a base for like two, three months. And then I'm off um traveling or doing something so um but now i'm starting to really miss traveling and just wanting to like oh get away and do stuff but um um but it did um one thing which really helped is i got um uh, in in february i'm i'm, I'm on quite a few like email distribution lists and a company called innovate reached out like hey we've got this new pair of trainers would you like would anybody like to try them out these are the sizes we've got so i was like Yay, of course. Ah, oh, love a free pair of trainers. <laughs> Amazing. So sent sent them sent the, that reply back at me in February. And then you know, nothing as much happened. And I got got the sent the shoes and they sent an email saying, Oh, we're looking forward to seeing your review. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I've got to go, I've got to do something with these trainers. I've got to run or I've got, got to actually do something. get out. <laughs> yeah. But it made me think, hold on, Sarah, if you're feeling like this and you're, you know, quite a self motivated person, self motivated person, then you are not going to be alone. And mm. so March was actually a really fun month because I came up with something called the March Daily Mile Challenge, which was I created like this runner bingo sheet with the different types of run, like run in fancy dress, um, you know, run backwards, don't do that, that's horrendous. You know, run <laughs> north, run south, run east, listen to podcasts, you know, unplug, write, draw a Strava picture, all these different things, and got members of my community involved. And it was about running one mile every day, and it's. You know, it's not really about the distance. It's about more, it's about having a purpose every day mm. to get out of the house. Because I wasn't, I don't, 
I wasn't leaving the house at all. Like I just literally in my bedroom, working away, um, pottering along. Um, so that was great. So I had a month of running every day in March, which mm. to be honest, I think massively helped like my mental health and be, and also cause the sun is starting to shine again yeah. and the days are getting longer. And I think that all started to combine together, but, um, yeah, I'm excited for, for, you know, to, to get back to, to traveling again and just, yeah. yeah. Cause that's one of the, the joys of all the privileges of doing, you know, having this digital nomadic lifestyle is to be able to, to travel and explore. So it's been, it. yeah, it's yeah. been tough. Yeah. Yeah. We'll jump into the future stuff in a second, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious, as you say, lockdown tricky, you know, particularly for you being here in the winter months, did you find that you were able to draw on any of the lessons or experiences and challenges you'd faced from your travels previously to get you through the COVID times? Oh, massively, massively so. Mm. Um, because I think what you end up doing when you do these like challenges and have these experiences, you end up building like this toolbox of, uh, of knowledge and skills and, and also being able to listen to certain women about how they cope. You know, so I've spoken to a lot of women who've been in the polar regions around Antarctic mm. or been in these extreme remote situations, you know, how they handled it. And I think I was very um, aware of certain things like, you know, gratitude, like, and I know, like, I keep coming back to it, but the fact is, you know, I'm so fortunate to be in the position that I'm in to not have to, to worry about, look, if everything, if Chef Guard Challenges collapsed, um, I, I would still have a bed, I would still have food, I still have, you know, friends and family who love me and support mm -hmm. me. So I think that's obviously a very fortunate position to be in. You know, I wasn't able to go and work the jobs that I normally work, but equally I didn't have th those ex expenses I need to pay. Um, things like, you know, positive mental attitude, the power of self-talk. I was very aware of what I was saying to myself, but also things like self-care, yeah. kindness. Um, and giving myself permission to be like, you know what, today's going to be a pyjama day. You're going to stay in your pyjamas, but you're going to be healthy because you're going to drink lots of water. And then you're going to watch your, you know, watch your shows, um, watch your Netflix, read your books, whatever. Have a nice bath with Epsom, light some candles and just you know, allow myself, give myself permission to do that. And also to not feel guilty that I'm not working out and training as, as hard as I should be. You know, mm -hmm. I did try, uh, routines are, are a great thing to do. And, uh, you know, a lot of, of adventurers will talk about the routines that they introduce when they're on their extreme endurance challenges. And it was something that I tried to incorporate into my life. And they might have been really simple things, though. It was like, I wanted to make sure that I was drinking like three bottles of water a day, having my supplements, yeah. watching like, you know, like a motivational TED talk for 10 minutes while massaging my feet. I had like an acupuncture mat, which I would lie on for 20 minutes. So really Ooh, like that simple. Sounds interesting. <laughs> oh, they're great. I love them. So there was definitely a lot of tips and advice um, that, that I could follow, which mm. I'd, I'd learned from, from myself but also from, um, from other people. I mean, a key one as well, um, and, and you talk about, you know, looking to the future, which is obviously fantastic, but sometimes it's about being in the present. Yeah. And uh, I definitely started to, to realize that if I started thinking too far ahead, well, what's going to happen? You know, it was just making me really anxious. I mm. also was very conscientious of what I was filling my mind with, with regards to social media and news consumption. Yeah. So I did, I wanted to be informed, but it's, at one point I realized this is not good for me. Like I, this is not, this is just, I'm getting overwhelmed um, mm. and I need to, to just close that, to close that off um, and focus on the day to day, literally what I'm doing, waking up, what I'm doing. So yeah, yeah. Lo loads of, loads of things. No, that's cool. We're the same. We, we, we're the same, you know, we don't, we don't have a TV that we can watch anyway, but it's like the news comes through the, the people we interact with for us because it's, it's just not something additional that we can fit into you know, potentially bombard our mental space, which in reality is quite fragile and there's so much going on all of the time. So yeah, I, I hear you with that. Well, I feel like, again, there's so many different ways that I could start to wrap this thing up. Um, you know, it's been really, really cool to explore all of this with you. And I would like to talk just very briefly about the future, 2021. Obviously, it's still a little bit uncertain. We don't know what the current climate is going to look like, but we can make plans and we can do our best to, to see how they go. So I'd like to dive down, down that route just, just briefly. And then I'd like to just come back to the podcast because I feel that's where most people know you from. And just to see, you know, if there's anybody in particular who's inspired you, any lessons that you have learned to sort of implement and, and weave into your life. So let's head, let's head down the lane of 2021. What's it looking like for you? 
Well, I've got a really fun challenge coming up in May. So I did the March Daily Mile Challenge, which was great with yeah. all of the running. And then I've got a friend called Ellen. Um, and she started something in lockdown called uh, the Cheshire Challenge, which is to walk every long distance walking path that is in Cheshire, which is local. That's and there are a couple which runs quite close to me. So I've enjoyed her on quite a few walks. And we're actually doing a 12 hour endurance challenge on the 15th of May. And we're, so on the Wirral, there's something called the Wirral Circular Trail, mm -hmm. which is I've seen like four different distances. For some, it's like 35 miles. For other people, it's like 39. So we'll see. But we're going to start that at six o'clock in the morning and see how far we can we can get on that trail this one big loop and if you know um I'd, I'd like to finish it but we'll see how it goes um in june i'm going to be doing a yin yoga course and i'm just looking at doing maybe like a 30-day yoga challenge and inviting mm. you know people to come and do it with me just you know spend 10 15 minutes of stretching gentle movements bit of you know, mindful breathing and meditation i think that's very very powerful but then apart from that i've got this um I've got this spreadsheet, obviously, or like obviously. a Trello, obviously, <laughs> and like a Trello board and uh, Pinterest boards of all these different challenges and adventures that I want to go on. So, you know, some of them are quite local. So, I, you know, like the Anglesey Coastal Path will be quite amazing. That's not too far away from me. Mm. I was meant to be walking like the West Highland Way, depending on travel and vaccines. If I could get down to France and walk the Camino, that would be incredible. If the borders open up with Australia, um, I'd love to fly to Australia in October and spend time with my family. And then <laughs> there's lots of ifs and buts, but if, um, if Australia do a travel bubble with New Zealand, then I'd head over to New Zealand and walk to your Aroa Trail. That would be just incredible yeah. <laughs> um but but do it so you know walk the north island and then come back for christmas and then walk the south island and then come back to you so you know i would be in australia from like october through to april miss mm. the winter come back to the uk um so i'm basically i i am planning things so i've planned like lots of my adventures i know the budgets how to get there how to get away what's what the logistics are for all of these challenges yeah. but i'm being i'm trying to just be really open and really flexible like if you know, depending on how things go, if it works out, fantastic, brilliant. If it doesn't, being okay with that and think, okay, well, what can I do next month? It might, you know, things might change in August, things might change yeah. in September. Let's let's play things by ear. But actually planning has been, I've really enjoyed, I enjoy the aspect of it, you know, doing a research and you know, watching vlogs and videos <laughs> and reading blogs and going on social media and, you know, and, and just sort of putting plans in, in place. So mm. 2021, still a little bit up in the air, but hopefully, I mean, I'm desperate to get walking and hiking and vlogging and challenging yeah. again. So, yeah. yeah. No, it's really good to hear that, you know, because again, it's, it's sort of just helping people look at their year and, and, and just be reminded that actually, you know, just just because everyone's off doing X doesn't mean you have to do that. Find your own way, find your own path, stay open, stay fluid, stay flexible, and you will be able to make a, a solid year out of the time we've got. So let's, let's have, let's go back to the podcast then. I would like to know, and I know it's unfair because as you say, you've had 400 plus episodes <laughs> and geez, I don't know how you've managed that, but good effort. Um, are there any conversations you've had with people that, that really stand out for you? So that could, that could stand out for a number of reasons. Could be it inspires you, it motivates you. It could be, it was just like their story really, really struck you as, as for whatever reason. So are there any people that, that you sort of carry with you day to day? Oh, I do. Um, one, everyone, my, one of my just, utterly favorites and it's like my i've got just got such a connection with this with this woman so i don't know if you've heard of rosie swale poe yeah she's, love her <laughs> oh god she's just like um just such an inspiration such a role model and so incredible for those that don't know um rosie is this phenomenal adventurer she's 74 years young at the moment and um Recently, she was running from UK and Brighton all the way through to Kathmandu um, in Nepal. Um, I had the privilege of meeting up with her in Turkey in, uh, in December 2019. And she's just amazing, just incredible. Her, her life, her philosophy, her wisdom, her words, the way that she lives her life. Um, you know, unfortunately, because of uh, COVID, she was locked down. Um, and then she came back to the UK and then she ended up running the jog and she came and saw me, and she came and saw me on my birthday, which was epic. So, you know, she bought her, she, she runs with this like red cart behind her called slick chick or there's ice chick as well. Um, and that was just amazing. But I think what inspires me most about Rosie is, um, she, it's, it's the fact that she's 74 years young and she's just living life on her terms. Mm. Like just, she's just out there every day, you know, running and journey and adventuring and she's just such an inspiration. And it, it gives me hope that when I am her age, 
that I will still be living like this life of adventure. And um, I've done, you know, I've spoken to you after I spoke to Rosie before and I, like, I've just never spoken to anyone like Rosie. Like I'm like, she talks a lot, but if you really <laughs> listen, like the words of wisdom that she shares is, is, in, is incredible. And, um, and after meeting up with her in, in Turkey, I don't know, I just felt this like, affinity and and we would speak quite a lot on the phone when she while she was in turkey and stuck down during covid and she's just become a, just such a good friend now and one of my plans for the future is so rosie will get out and start running again to Kathmandu in nepal is that i'd like to go and meet her in nepal not not to run with her not to take away anything from her journey but just to be at the finish line to be a mm. supporter and she's running for a charity called phase worldwide and they have various projects over there so if i could go over there you know uh, you know vlog rosie go and do you know visit these charities over there do a couple of hikes myself as well that would be incredible but i mean i think the great thing about the podcast is the range of women that i've had on from their from their ages yeah. from the backgrounds from the different types of challenges because it, it, like you said it's not about copying what that person's done and it's not about comparing yourself to um, to these other women it's about picking and choosing what aspects would work from you you know figuring out how they did it, why they did it, and how you can apply that to your, to your own life. And yeah. you know, that's one of my biggest rules. It's, it's not about comparison. You know, just be, if you're running 5K, 5 miles, 50 miles, or 500 miles, you can still learn from each of these individuals. But it's about you finding your own personal challenge that really you know, does motivate and inspire you and excites you when you get, when you get out of bed. And you know, some of the challenges the, the, that these women have, have shared are just awe-inspiring and amazing but they're also just really normal everyday women who have yeah. they've just decided to do something and they followed through and and how they've done it and um yeah it's been such a privilege to to share their stories but I mean so many different I literally that's a whole other episode I'll be talking like <laughs> another hour all, I'm all sure it is <laughs> yeah. no it's powerful stuff though and, and I love you know what you're saying about comparison it's it really really resonates with me i think it's very easy it's a very easy trap to fall into is comparison but the best thing we can we can be is ourselves isn't it really so um before we before we end this thing uh i have 10 quick fire questions for you so i ask each guest these questions so my obviously they're quite short questions on my part but if you want to dive into them a little bit more we can are you ready Okay, I'm slightly nervous because I, <laughs> no. do, I do quick fire questions as well, but it's always different when you're on the, on the other side of the microphone. Okay, I want to add that in. Okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. Bring it All on. All right, let's jump in. Question number one: What was the last book you read and loved? Oh, uh, <laughs> I really <laughs> wish I could show you my book pile that I've got at the moment. Uh, I love. Um, uh, they're all on yin yoga at the moment so yeah. I, um so they're yin yoga type books but I'm, I'm not sure i want to give that as my answer there's there's a great book called i'm going to give this as my answer instead it's called the slight edge and i cannot remember the author's name i want to say jeff but the slight edge is, is a phenomenal book the it's about edge. this okay. The Slight Edge, please yeah. read it. It's about basically, it's about being consistent with your goals and what it is that you're trying to achieve and like little and often and consistency, how that can play a part. Mm, cool. So for example, you know, if you want to um, get more reading in your life, uh, most people like feel overwhelmed and just don't read anything. Whereas if you actually made a consistent effort just to read 10 pages every day, you probably finish like 10 or 12 books um, every year sort of thing. Mm. So it's about being consistent with your exercise. It's not about hitting it hard every single day. Um, Oh, and missing it it's about you know showing up every day doing just mm. a little 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 and often it's the same with like saving money like you think it's not having an impact but if you're saving on a consistent basis and so I think I've definitely applied a lot of that philosophy to what I do with tough girl challenges and like that it's that accumulation effect so you know when I started the tough girl podcast you start with four episodes and you have five six seven yeah um which you know, the grand scheme of things isn't a lot, but four or five years later, it's suddenly like 400. But that's, that's because I've just been really consistent every single week with releasing, with releasing episodes. So yeah, the slight edge is very, very powerful. That sounds fantastic. I'm going to read that. And for listeners, mm -hmm. I'll find the, the details of that. And I'll put that in the show notes because um, I'm a big believer as anyone who follows spend more time <coughs> in the world will know it. Consistency is key. <laughs> mm. So that's great. All right. Question number two, are you a morning or an evening person? I'm a bit of both. Like okay. I'm probably, I'm probably more evening. So yeah. I, um, I used to wake up ridiculously early when I had to set an alarm, and that was one of the, the one of the joys of my life is not setting an alarm. 
So it, it massively depends what time I wake up. Sometimes I wake up at 7.30, I'm like, hmm, okay, I'm awake, let's, you know, do some work. Other times I wake up, like, oh God, the other day I woke up, I had like a phone call at 10 and I, I set my alarm for 9.40, like I have a 15 minute reminder on my phone and I woke up to an alarm and I was like, yeah, why have I set an alarm? I was like, oh my God, it's 9.45. <laughs> but that's only because I've, I'd slept for so long. So um, that's probably more of an evening person. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, not Fair morning, enough. yeah. <laughs> all right that's cool uh question number three if you were reincarnated as an ice cream flavor what flavor would you be mint chop chip oh man that was quick why yeah, is that your I favorite to, to eat that's my favorite to eat but do i have to give a reason <laughs> go on go on okay well it's because mint if you ever think, think about mint mint is amazing mm. because it's in so many different things like it's great in pims you have like mint toothpaste you have like after eight mints but the after eight mints you can turn into like a mint mousse you know you, you chewing gum mint so it makes you fresh <laughs> you have given this some thought <laughs> oh, then you you know mint in a nice glass of pims oh amazing and like mint ice cream like yeah mint chop chip mint for the win <laughs> all right i do you know i'm really i'm glad i asked you to go into that that was good <laughs> okay uh what did you want to be when you were growing up uh probably a princess to be honest <laughs> <laughs> fair enough that that's the pink theme i guess <laughs> yeah i actually had i had this most incredible skirt so i when i was over in camp america um i went to like these dis big discount malls and they had like this ralph Lauren shop and ralph Lauren had this pink like um ballerina type massive like 400 layers of pink chiffon for like 30 dollars or something and oh my god i love that skirt it was inc <laughs> oh my god i used to wear it for all my we used to have like university formals <laughs> it was incredible as my fa oh my favorite outfit ever my big sounds oh, bold yeah. <laughs> very bold oh, i love it, it. love it and uh, what is your most unusual talent oh uh unusual Oh my god i really mm. wish i had one i don't think i've got any, <laughs> anything I'm, I'm talentless um nothing jumped to mind no. I, you know our spreadsheets could come up here <laughs> no i'm not no but i'm not that you know like i wouldn't have to work pivot tables it took oh, me like four enough. hours trying to buy um, <laughs> unusual talent i'm i'm a it's not i'm a speed reader i don't know if that's unusual i can read very rapidly like mm. um i can consume a book in like a day like um, easily wow. like really fast reader uh, well, I suppose it's not really a talent because I don't think I'm very talented at it but I got an art scholarship to my school and for my GCSE exam I got 100% so, oh, for, wow. so, so I was the highest mark in the country obviously joint with the other people who did very well hmm. um, that's, that's, a bit, that's a bit random um, <laughs> Oh no, I, I feel as though I'm lacking in talent. Like, oh, there must be something <laughs> well, else. Well, we know that's not true, Sarah. So we'll, we'll take those two responses unless something else pops up between now and the end. <laughs> I'll keep thinking. All right, cool. Um, who has inspired you most in your life? Oh, it's such a good question. I suppose one woman who's really inspired me and I, I, I use her quite a lot is um, a lady called Ros Savage. Have you heard oh. of her? Jeez, yeah, she like Ugh. I grew up just devouring her books, and yeah. boy, she inspired me too. <laughs> she, so, for the, for those who um, don't know, Roz is an incredible um, ocean rower. She was, I think, she was the first person or uh, to row yeah. uh, single handedly row the Atlantic Pacific and the Indian Ocean. Yeah. But her background, she worked in management consultancy until she was thirty eight before she decided to make some big changes in her in her life. And um, one of the things that she talked about um, was writing this obituary on like how she decided what to do with her life. And she wrote these two obituaries, uh, uh, you know, one like the sort of the normal one, then the one that the life that she actually did want to lead. Mm. And I think when I heard about Ros, when I was, I think I first discovered her when I was like 32 and it gave me comfort because it was just like, but I'm, I've got, you know, she's 38 when she made that change. I started making this change at 32. So it's not like I've got like a six year head start, but it made me think, well, hold on, if she can do it at 38, then I can do this at 32. And, you know, everything that she's gone on to, to do, like, you know, the motivational speaking, the books that she's written, how she'd, insp how she's inspired other women. I think she, that she's been an amazing, um, mm you know role model and i've had a few like um you know conversations with her separately and she's been uh you know a great sort of mentor and, and help to me when you know making certain decisions and um yeah incredibly inspiring incredibly inspiring she is i can only agree with you there no thank you for that answer that's cool um okay we've got three more to go 
What is your favourite food? Oh, oh, uh, <laughs> uh, what is my favourite food? <laughs> I'm going to say something really rubbish. <laughs> but um, I'm a big fan of, no, I can't, no, I can't. I was going to say I'm a big fan of butter. Like, I really oh, love enough. butter. <laughs> but, like, not, like, only on, like, you know, like, bread and potatoes and stuff. So, but I don't really eat bread and potatoes, so I don't end up eating, like, butter so that, just that much. Just chow on the butter, you know? <laughs> no, I wouldn't, but I do, like, I do, I probably have too much butter when okay. I butter things. And, yeah, like, you know, yeah. your butter is No, like there, there isn't too much. My partner would say there is not too much butter. <laughs> <laughs> but you butter the top, and then you butter, like, the sides, and then you bite it, and then you butter the sides again. Yeah. Like. <laughs> All right, ideal. Okay, uh, what's your favourite outdoor space? Oh, the beach. The beach. Oh, okay, fair enough. Just because you like beaches in general? Um, so A, it's because I grew up by the beach. But mm -hmm. the other thing I really noticed, so when I was on the Appalachian Trail, one of the, its nicknames is it's known as like the Green Tunnel because mm -hmm. you're covered in um, the, the, the leaves like all the time. And so by the time I actually finished the trail, I was actually quite uh, claustrophobic of being covered and mm. i didn't really like being outdoors under the trees like it made me feel very uncomfortable and that hence one of the reasons that i did the the pacific coast um highway cycle ride was because i was desperate okay. for um open space mm. the waves um that type of environment um so i yeah i love love beach and actually interesting enough like all my favorite places so my brother lives by the beach in melbourne so you know literally you know 200 meters from the beach there spending when i was in goa doing my yoga teacher training that was right on the beach and it's just like happy place that's cool yeah, yeah. love place. the beach ideal love the beach <laughs> life here yeah. that's it all right final question then of our quick fires do you have any catchphrases or mantras that you live your life by oh such a good one um one of the one of the ones which became really popular uh i don't necessarily use it that much anymore but i definitely used it a couple of years ago have you heard of the one like be the egg no no oh. be the egg <laughs> be the egg be the egg so i spoke with this incredible woman called um called uh paris paris edwards who's a triathlete and she was basically it's a story of the the egg and the potato so you have a pan of boiling water the water represents the environment that you're in, you know, all the crap which is going on in the world. And if you put an, an egg, um, you know, yeah. in its shell into the water and, a, you know, a baked potato in the water and you leave, you know, what happens to the potato? The potato disintegrates and falls apart. But what happens to the egg? You, it becomes solid and harder and tougher. Um, so you want to be the egg. And it, Man, and it just became so a massive catchphrase. And it just makes you think about like how you, you control your emotions. So you are the egg. So mm. you have literally got no control over the boiling water and the environment. So the only thing that you can control is your attitude and how you respond to that. So mm. you get tougher, you get stronger. Um, yeah, so be, be the egg. Be the there. egg. Oh, be the egg. I can't tell be you how much egg. I love that. <laughs> you should get that on a t-shirt. That is good. <laughs> Um, another uh, Jasmine, I can't remember her name. She was going after the Le Jog cycling record, and she mm -hmm. had caps made with like "Be the Egg" on. Because it's so actually it's resonated brilliant. with a with a with a lot of women. Just mm. you know, in terms of like uh, how you can control yourself. But do I have another one? No, I think that'll be a, that's we'll a good. We'll take one. that. Be the we'll egg. Take that. I'm going to remember that one as well. So that's, that's cool. <laughs> Niche but good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, Sarah, thank you so much for your answers to those questions and this entire conversation. It's been an absolute pleasure to, to dive in a little bit deeper to you and your story. And just to, to end this, I'd love to leave the listeners with some final words of advice or encouragement that, that you might have to share. Anyone who, who's listening, who's been inspired to get out, make the most of 2021, what would you like to leave them with today? Oh, right. I'm, I'm going to be a bit practical here. I'm going to be you practical. Like practical? Well. Yeah. <laughs> Because sometimes I uh, like it's like I know the like just do it is great advice, but sometimes it's like no 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 we need to take it a step back. Mm -hmm. So my practical advice is put a plan in place, be a planner. Mm -hmm. um, so what I mean by that is sit down. Like there's lots of things that you can do. Brainstorm your ideas. Ten minutes, okay, ten minutes. Blank piece of paper. Put some nice music in. Get yourself in the right frame of mind and write down every single goal, dream, desire 
place you want to visit, experience you want to experience, life you want to lead, drop it all down. Don't overthink it. Don't think, well, I can never do that. Write it all down. Blitz it for 10 minutes. Then you've got an idea of, you know, where you want to go. Then you can start planning, you know, pros and cons lists either side. What if this happened? What if that happened? So put a plan in place, put a plan in place, break it down and use that as your, as your starting point to figure out what it is that you want to do. Because, you know, don't be like me. I would spend more time planning for my summer holidays than I would planning for my actual life. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't done it already, think about what do you want to achieve with your life? What is your mission? What is your purpose? What's the type of life that you want to be leading? Get descriptive, write it down, put a plan in place. And um, yeah, that would be my advice. Put a plan in place, be a planner. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really like it. And finally, where can listeners find out more information about you if they would like to dive into that? please visit my website, which is toughgirlchallenges.com and all of the information is there. There's more information about me, my different challenges, the books that I've written, all of the incredible women um, that I've spoken with, all the past episodes are there. There's links to my social media, most active on Instagram if you want to come and see day-to-day life of, uh, of me. <laughs> uh, then come and follow at Tough Girl Challenges. But, uh, but yeah, that's where it all happens, toughgirlchallenges.com. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. Well, Sarah, you're a legend. Love your stuff. Keep it up. And uh, I'm really excited to follow along for 2021. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure to speak with you. Nice one. Speak soon. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye. <laughs> bye. Well, folks, as I mentioned, I am a longtime fan of Sarah's work with the Tough Girl podcast and all that she does in inspiring women and girls to get outdoors and active. If you haven't already headed to our site, now is the time to do just that. And whilst you're at it, do leave us a review and share this episode with your friends and family so that we can spread the word that getting outdoors matters. And finally, don't forget, if you'd like to support all that we're doing with Wild, please do join our online community by heading to www.patreon.com forward slash spend more time in the wild. Thanks folks, that's all for now. And until next time, Stay wild. We'll see you soon.